if you say to people, um, do you worry about climate change? They say yes. Then you say, what, what do you think we should do about it? Well, we should use less plastic. Actually, that's nothing to do with climate change. It's something else. Oh, okay, right. Well, uh, what about planting trees? Oh, yeah, no, they're fine, plant trees. Um, what about um, uh, uh, giving up your uh, gas cooker? Suddenly, the mood changes in the room, as it were. Um, uh, and the, 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 the government likes to pretend that this stuff might be cost-free. All the evidence suggests that it's not. Um, you know, if we're supposed to heat our homes with uh, ground source heat pumps or air source heat pumps in the future uh, or electricity, those are going to be much more expensive. Mm -hmm. If we're going to get our electricity from wind farms in the North Sea, that is two to three, perhaps even four times as expensive as gas at the moment. They keep saying, no, it's not. It's coming down in price. The bids are coming down, but the cost is not coming down. Hello and welcome to Recent UK with me, Darren Grimes. Please do consider hitting that little subscribe button and the notification bell if you enjoy today's show. Now, Boris Johnson has decided that his government will worship at the altar of the green, putting in place a petrol car ban by 2030 and a 10-point plan in addition to this. Now, is this a mistake? Whilst there's no difference between voters' concerns for the environment if we poll those more likely to vote Conservative and indeed Labour, it is likely to change, in my view, if Boris Johnson's green agenda starts to hit his new voters in the pocket. Will those without a middle-class safety net who could find... Uh, it difficult actually to purchase cheap meat, holidays, vans and energy be quite miffed about losing these gifts of modern progress. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to say that I'm joined by Matt Ridley to discuss these issues and it's not just because he supports Newcastle United. Matt has right. a fantastic new book out called How Innovation Works and Why It Flourishes in Freedom which is should all check out as well. Hello Matt, how are you doing? Darren, it's really good to be with you um, on the most brilliant podcast uh, that there is. Well, high praise, high praise. Now, Matt, there are many cli uh, climate scientists who reckon that the planet is facing some issues, but there are some with, I think, more nuanced views who'd, who'd like to see some action, but s are too afraid to actually voice the fact that they don't think they agree with the sort of Tunbergs of the world or the Extinction Rebellions of the world. We're not going to drown to death by 2030. You know, we're not going to burn to death in a ball of flames because the planet's going to heat up to such a temperature that it's pretty unfeasible for life to sustain itself anymore. Yet they don't voice these opinions because they are in fear of Twitter's venom and vitriol that silences those who reckon the hyperbole is a bit, well insane i wonder if that's something that you've come across where you get people saying to you listen matt i completely agree with you but i'm just far too scared to say it yes i have that conversation quite often um and with some very distinguished scientists um who say uh, i'm not going to say this publicly but i think you've got a point when you say that we're exaggerating the urgency of this problem uh, that we're exaggerating how bad it is at the present already uh, and that, that our projections of how bad it can get are based on some very dodgy assumptions. For example, most of the, the prognostications you see that say we're going to face four degrees of warming this century are based on a, a, a scenario called RCP 8.5, which assumes that we'll burn 10 times as much coal in 2100 uh, as we do today. Well, anyone sensible thinks we'll be burning less coal in 2100 than we are mm -hmm. today. So, you know, that's sort of completely balmy assumption that you need to feed in. And they think there'll be 12 billion people on the planet, whereas most people think there'll be about 10 and so on. You know, so so feed in some mad assumptions and you get mad outcomes. You then don't tell the media that it's based on mad assumptions. They never check. Uh, and you come up with, with extreme projection. Climate change is real. It's happening. Uh, it's, it's a problem. We do have to, to sort it. But all the evidence suggests that it is not yet causing significant problems. That is to say, there is no increase in the severity or frequency of uh, storms or droughts. 
Uh, it's actually causing an increase in crop yields. Uh, it's causing a general greening of ecosystems. So the net benefits probably outweigh the net harms so far, and that's likely to continue for a few decades. Now, lots of people say after that it plunges into a very nasty situation, and they might be right. There's plenty of argument about that. But if we're going to tackle this problem, it's very important we don't listen to people who simply don't accept that rough consensus about where we are. I do accept that. The people who are outside that consensus are people like Greta Thunberg and the Extinction Rebellion who say um, we're going to be starving in 10 years, we're going to have to eat each other in the next decade. Um, th there is a mass extinction uh, caused by climate change going on already. In fact, there's no confirmed species extinctions caused by climate change yet at all. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so on. So it, the, exa the exaggeration is dreadfully asymmetric. You can get away with murder if you say it's worse than, than the consensus uh, agrees. But if you say, I don't think it's as bad as the consensus says, uh, then you are uh, persecuted, hounded, and uh, you know the editor who publishes your article will be uh, inundated with attempts to silence you and report you to uh, authorities and so on. So it's a very odd debate now. Be I mean, because the, the green agenda has very much captured in its totality, hasn't it? The cultural, political, educational, corporate elite. And the, there's very much, of very precious little room for any conversation in the middle ground. And yet, as I think you're aware, with your northeast background like me, it's not the same in the pubs of clubs of County no, Durham. no. Um, and nor is it the same, by the way, in, you know, Nigeria or somewhere like that. There's a there's a huge global poll that, that uh, gives millions of people all over the world a chance to express their priorities. What do you think is the most urgent issue? And it lists about 20. Climate change has consistently for years and years come bottom of that poll. Uh, it's below mobile phone reception. Uh, as a problem that people face in the developing world, not not in the rich world. Mm. So, so I I really feel that that on the whole this is a um, uh, uh, what do we call it a rich world problem, you know, mm -hmm. um, that uh, that people are uh, overemphasizing. And yes, if you ask people in Durham or anywhere else, do you think we should worry about climate change? Of course they say yes. So do I. You know, I mean that's not difficult. But if you say are you prepared to pay twice as much to heat your home and give up your gas boiler and your gas cooker uh, and have to pay more for a car, uh, which will be all electric? Uh, they immediately change their tune. I mean, there's, folk, there's very clear focus group evidence on this, that it's, it's highly sensitive to price. Uh, well, you've just took the next question out of my mouth, really, which would, you know, of course, voters do say that, don't they? They say that they support green policies. But... What could you elaborate? What some of those responses have been, or what what some of the data tells us about the fact that if you ask people if they're still likely to back those green policies, if they lead to, I don't know, you losing affordable meat, holidays, vans, uh, energy, and it becoming almost out of reach to access some of those for some people, unless you've the financial cushion to take on some of those added cost burdens by by green policies. Well, at the moment, the costs are disguised. That is to say, you pay more for your electricity to the yeah. tune of about £10 billion nationally. Um, uh, and that goes to support subsidies to renewable energy. And that's a climate-driven driven policy. Now, most people don't know that. It's mm -hmm. not at all transparent. You can't see it on your electricity bill. And, of course, that does hit poor people harder than it hits rich people because uh, electricity bills are a bigger part of a household budget in a poor household mm -hmm. than they are in a, big, in a, in a rich household. Um, and, you know, just back to the focus group point, if you, uh, as I understand it, and I haven't done these focus groups, but I've talked to people who, who do, uh, if you say to people, um, do you worry about climate change? They say yes. Then you say, what, what do you think we should do about it? Well, we should use less plastic. Actually, that's nothing to do with climate change. It's something else. Oh, okay, right. Well, uh, what about planting trees? Oh, yeah, no, that's fine, plant trees. Um, what about um, uh, uh, giving up your uh, gas cooker? Suddenly, the mood changes in the room, as it were. Um, uh, and 
the, the, the government likes to pretend that this stuff might be cost free, but all the evidence suggests that it's not. Um, you know, if we're supposed to heat our homes with uh, ground source heat pumps or air source heat pumps in the future uh, or electricity, those are going to be much more expensive. Mm -hmm. If we're going to get our electricity from wind farms in the North Sea, that is two to three, perhaps even four times as expensive as gas at the moment. They keep saying, no, it's not. It's coming down in price. The bids are coming down, but the cost is not coming down. So why are the bids coming down? Because the wind farm companies are know perfectly well that these contracts they're signing up for uh, are, do not oblige them to supply that price. Hmm. They can walk away from the contract when the, when the wind farm's ready to go in five or ten years' time and say, no, no, actually, sorry, we need to charge you twice as much. So there's a nasty shock in store. Uh, and, of course, they're in the business of selling the wind farm on to a, a big, rich investor, and you can usually pull the wool over his eyes, you know, as long as you've got the contract. So there's some pretty dodgy, crony capitalism going on on this. And one of the, one of the shocking things to me is the degree to which the environmental movement, you know, the, the, the pressure groups have become just pure shills for one industry, the wind industry. I mean, mm. why? You know, what's so special about wind? It takes 150 tonnes of coal to make a wind turbine. It, uh, if you erect lots of them in the North Sea, you're going to chop up a lot of migratory birds. You know, in what sense is this even green? Um, mm. They only they don't last as long as we thought. There's, da there's very new data out of Denmark showing that actually they might only last 16 years. Well, they spent the first seven or eight years repaying the emissions that had to be emitted to manufacture the wind turbine. Yeah, so, the, um, the amount of cement and everything that's required. Exactly. And electric cars cost a lot more than uh, diesel cars or petrol cars and don't save much in the way of emissions. I mean, you, mm. you have to put in assumptions about how long the battery is going to last. And if it lasts a long time, then they do save a bit. And if it lasts a short time, then they don't save anything at all because the battery is very emission heavy in its manufacture. And by the way, it's made in China where the emissions come from coal and all that kind of thing. So um, so th there is some, some genuinely uh, sort of uh, um, dishonest uh, messaging here. But I'd quite like to get on to the point about innovation, because I think, you know, quite rightly, the government thinks, well, innovation will come to our rescue and we'll bring down some of these prices. And I think you were going to. Yeah, no, I, I, so I, I, I wonder if then if I can if I can do a, a double question from that, then. Is it possible to protect living standards and quality of life if we do make this jump in going green and and at hunting for net zero because surely it's a mistake ultimately for Boris Johnson to elevate the green agenda as the focal point of his government if ultimately at the end of it he's going to end up making his new voters poorer I'm very concerned about that I, I don't think um, the Conservatives won in the streets of Workington and Consett because they promised net zero. Um, uh, I think it's relatively low down on, on, on people's concerns. Definitely. And if you, um, if you take today's technologies and try to deliver net zero uh, with them, then there's no question the, the cost of living will go massively up, enormously up, okay? Uh, so, um, Yes, the, 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 you know, renewables cannot deliver this vision. There isn't enough space for a start. I mean, you would need uh, uh, you'd need to cover pretty well half the North Sea with wind turbines to produce enough electricity. And then you'd have the problem of reliability when it isn't a windy day. Um, so you'd have to have something else to back it up. And then you've got to, the cost of that has then got to be added on. And by the way, this, the, you know, the grid system has got to be completely rebuilt mm. to cope with this. Um, uh, and the you know the the intermittency is a real problem. It, you know the wind can vary from minute to minute, and that can be very difficult to manage. So, um, so renewables just can't do it, and we're not nearly sunny enough as a country for solar to do it. Uh, and by the way, we don't really. I mean, there's already a lot of the home counties covered in solar panels. I don't think that's a very nice way of treating our countryside. Myself. So, um, and it just it's worth asking yourself the question: What percentage of the world's energy? And remember, this is a global problem. What percentage of the world's energy in 2019 came from wind and solar combined? I'm guessing that most people would answer 20, 30 something percent. 
because every story about energy you ever see is now illustrated with a picture of a wind turbine. Well, the true answer is 1.4%. That you know, that it's barely in the it's barely a rounding error. Uh, 94% of our energy came from burning things, coal, oil, gas, and also wood. You know, we burn a lot of wood. We burn it in power stations, but we also burn it in traditional ways uh, as well. Um, so I don't think renewables can deliver that vision, let alone affordably. Now, nuclear could deliver the scale, but at the moment it couldn't deliver it affordably. And the reason for that is because we have deliberately driven up the cost of nuclear. We've made it incredibly expensive because of the way we regulate it. We've essentially cut it off from the process of innovation because we've said if you want to build a new design of nuclear power station, you've got to get it licensed in a process that will cost you billions of pounds and take um, uh, seven, eight, nine years. Well, so forgive my ignorance, but is that what Rolls-Royce are doing with their smaller reactors? Well, the big hope here is that we can drive down the cost of nuclear by making smaller reactors and mass producing them. Because, you know, the way we drove down the cost of the car or the bicycle is by mass producing it. So if we can mass produce nuclear reactors instead of building each one as a separate project like an Egyptian pyramid, um, uh, then perhaps we can get the cost down. And that's a big hope. But it, it will need more sensible, more nimble regulation to achieve. And, and it might work. And there are great new technologies for nuclear waiting in the winds, wings, um, uh, molten salt reactors in particular. Uh, you know, I personally think that Rolls-Royce's stuff, though great, is not as great as some of the newer technologies. But our regulator simply doesn't know how to license the new technologies and, and, and uh, you know, can't give any certainty that it would ever give approval uh, mm -hmm. how long it would take, even though these are inherently safer technologies mm -hmm. because they don't involve, you know, water which can turn to steam and you know, all that kind of and solid fuel rods, which have the problem that you, you know, you can't get at some of it and so on. They poison themselves. Um, uh, so, uh, so, you know, nuclear, if you're really serious about net zero, then we should forget renewables. And because, by the way, another thing that renewables do is they poison the economics of nuclear. Mm. Because nuclear has to run flat out full full whack as much of the time as it can otherwise it can't repay its enormous capital cost um and it it's very difficult to turn up and down you can't switch it on and off you can turn gas on and off so when you put renewables on a system and the wind stops blowing you want to have gas on the system that you can turn on and off you don't want nuclear so one of the effects of increasing renewables in recent years is that it's actually driven nuclear away the because you've absolutely no choice about turning wind or solar on and off. That's right. Wind or solar is, you know, free at the point of delivery once it's once the wind's blowing. Yeah, pretty, pretty well. Um, uh, and so you 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 give it prior prioritized access to the system, um, uh, and that makes it very hard to make a nuclear add up. So some of the nuclear power stations in California, for example, have closed down simply because renewables have made them uneconomic. So, you know, it, it, the, the two zero carbon power sources are f fighting against each other. Um, and I, I mean, I wonder then, going back to that point about Boris trying to out green the opposition, surely that's that's a bit insane because he's never going to be able to, is he really? And if we consider the uh, one piece of planning permission that really got my back up was the, the Banks Mining Group in, in Northumberland. And that would have been high skill, high paid jobs in a in a region that needs them more than most. When the alternative is to ship the coal that we need for Boris Johnson's levelling up agenda with steel and infrastructure being a very intensive part of that levelling up agenda. And simply to export those jobs that come with that extraction of coal over to the likes of Russia, Australia, the United States of America... And it just strikes me that there's just precious little thinking behind it, other than it's not the green thing to do. It's all about virtue signalling. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm very close to this uh, decision in Northumberland with the Banks Group, and I have worked very closely with them and uh, have indeed you know, been in commercial uh, business with them, but not on this new project. So I can now say what I think about this new project, which they uh, proposed to do, which was a... Uh, an open cast coal proposal uh, for the coast of Northumberland. And they went ahead with that on the grounds that uh, the government has not banned coal mining. 
right? It has said it wants to phase out coal in the power sector, but it can't phase out coal in, in industry. We still need it for steel making and things like that. Cement, yeah. And cement, exactly. Um, and uh, so they went ahead in good faith with an application to dig up some coal that would be far cheaper, would have a far lower carbon footprint than the alternative. Most of our coal now comes from Russia, uh, where it travels you know, by train and by ship, an enormous carbon footprint of getting it here. Um, and instead of saying uh, uh, to the banks group right at the start, oh, by the way, we're not going to give you planning permission, whatever you do, we, we've just decided we'd rather give the jobs to Russians, which would have been at least honest. The government instead said, no, no, go ahead, go ahead, put in your planning application. Um, we haven't banned it. We haven't banned mining, uh, coal extraction. But then they found every excuse to turn it down. Uh, they they used uh, illegal reasons. I mean, reasons that were not right under their own laws. Um, that was put right in the courts. Mm. And yet they still then, then spent a huge amount of delay trying to find another reason. And 250 yes. good skilled jobs in... Northumberland are now going to Russians and I've talked to some of these people they drive diggers they're perfectly nice Northumbrian people and they say to me you know why why does my government want to give my job to a Russian um you know here I am in the north of England which I thought you valued um but that strikes me though that this is just the start this is what we're going to see more and more when uh, you know lads and lasses in in industries like that are told, I'm sorry, but you know that's that's not what the British economy is going to be about anymore. So your job, your livelihood, I'm afraid it's a case of tough titties. Well, it's not just um, uh, that the it's not just manufacturing jobs that are under threat here. Uh, I mean, yeah, even if you're working in the software industry, you need uh, server farms. They need mm. electricity. If we have the highest electricity prices in Europe, and we jolly nearly do for business, not for consumers, but for business, we do um, one of the highest. Um, then we will struggle to create jobs. Mm. Uh, the government keeps going on about how this green industrial plan is going to create two hundred fifty thousand jobs at a cost of twelve billion pounds. Well, that's forty eight thousand pounds a job. That's not a very good scheme. I could find a much cheaper way of creating two hundred fifty thousand jobs if that's your aim. But the whole point is, it's not jobs in producing the energy that count. It's jobs in using the energy. They're the ones that come for free. They're the, they're the ones that, that, that give you real economic growth. And just to get back to this point about innovation, because I think it's, it's really important. To, the, the government will say to the arguments I've been making, oh, come on, you're like the guy who in 1890 said, uh, we just need better horses. We... we you know, the, the future doesn't lie in these newfangled motor cars. Actually, quite the reverse. I'm the one saying, stop trying to squeeze innovation out of a 13th century technology that uses very, very low density energy, which is wind, uh, because you're up against the second law of thermodynamics and you might not succeed. You might not be able to get the price down or the productivity up. Um, and by the way, Yes, innovation will deliver amazing things in the next 10 years, but you cannot order it up to order in a particular sector just by spending money, just because you want to. It doesn't work that way. If it did, then we would have flying cars, personal jetpacks and routine space travel by now. That's what we were promised 50 years ago, uh, and none of it materialized because it turned out that it was actually much harder to innovate those things than, than we thought to make them affordable at least um, whereas it was much easier to innovate computers and mobile phones than we realized at the time so we tended to switch from transport innovation to communication innovation which is a really interesting phenomenon I think mm. um, uh, so uh, you know you can be a starry-eyed pro-innovation optimist like me and still think that it is not possible to demand cheaper electric cars, cheaper windmills, cheaper ground source heat pumps, and, and, and expect to get them. You might not. It's, that's not the way innovation works. It's not possible to just throw money at the problem and have it solve itself. And that's the element which I think really is quite a sort of pious notion, isn't it? That which, well, 
if we just hope really hard, the market will make it happen. You know, and, and, I mean, you've spoken in the past about how excited you are about f- the fusion energy space, for example, and, and, and that being a, a sign of a successful enterprise because it's actually managed to attract a lot of private sector operators into the sphere. And, it, it, you know, in your book, How Innovation Works and, and Why It Flourishes in Freedom, you discuss all of these things and surely a good sign of, of a, a market that that is a viable one to be to be excited about is how much private sector uh, interest it actually manages to generate. Because right now, it just strikes me that the kind of regulatory environment we've got is one in which vested interests are subsidised and will continue to be so even more with this green push. Yeah, uh, our energy system has gone from being on the whole a market system that rewarded you for being uh, both efficient and um, low cost to a purely political system that simply decides on the basis of uh, a central government strategy which uh, winners are going to be picked uh, and which are not. And one of the ironies of this is that it has actually led to us subsidizing the everything you know even gas now requires a subsidy because basically if you want to start a combined cycle gas turbine which is by far the cheapest way of producing um, electricity you find that um uh you you can't get a guaranteed contract to supply uh, all the time mm. you're burning um so you have to go into something called a capacity mechanism where you're basically in reserve for when the wind doesn't blow Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make sense economically. So you say, well, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that unless I get a a, a subsidy. So we end up subsidizing everything. It's it's the way... Insanity. Once you you start subsidizing one thing, you end up subsidizing everything. I I mean, Um, Lord Lawson made me laugh when he said... um, This was out this week when he said, well, we could create thousands of jobs by making sure that every town has to put up a statue of Boris Johnson. But I don't think that's a sensible idea or a good return for money. And it sort of did put it in perspective a little bit for me. Obviously, it's it's not quite the same thing. But if there are, you know, if there is a massive cost to the taxpayer for precious little reward, then you do have to take a step back and start to think about the consequences and the repercussions for some of the very poorest in society. Um, th- this is where it, it, it's, the, it's the interests of ordinary people that I think are, are being forgotten here. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I genuinely think this is a, 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 a an upper middle class obsession. You know, the, the polls quite show this relatively clearly. Um, and uh, yes, I would love to have low carbon uh, electricity um, and low carbon energy, uh, but I would also love to have Northumberland's hills backs without wind turbines all over them, you know, because they're an, they're a terrible eyesore, and they kill a lot of birds. Um, uh, and I would also love to have electricity that was always there when you flicked on the switch. We've got used to that, but increasingly we're not going to have that. This year alone, the, this autumn alone, there have been several near misses uh, where the uh, ele- operators of the national mm-hmm. grid have got to go out and say hang on, we're getting a bit desperate. The wind's not blowing. Uh, can, has anyone got any power they can give us? Uh, and sure enough, waiting in the winds, there are some diesel generator parks in the Midlands somewhere or somewhere like that, that that can switch on at a moment's notice and charge a fortune to give us electricity and produce lots of CO2 into the process. Mm-hmm. Yes, this is a diesel generator sitting Insane. there running away. <laughs> so... Um, uh, and you see so, that with operators in California as well, don't you? Where they say, well, actually, it would be good for us if you could turn your lights off for a bit, actually, because yeah, they've had no, a massive that, push. That started to happen dramatically. Mm-hmm. And, and wait till we get to the future where we've all got electric cars. And by the way, that means we need an even bigger electricity grid because, you know, suddenly there's going to be uh, all the cars on it. We're going to need at least another five Hinkley nuclear power stations to supply the electricity for that. But on a, a still cold night um, in the evening uh, when the wind's not blowing and the temperature's low and a lot of people's electric heating is on in their houses as well as their lighting and they're watching uh, Netflix and that's taking up a bit more and all that. Um, in the future, 
the grid might be able to say, right, we'll drain down everyone's electric car batteries a little bit. Uh, and that will be our storage system. It's quite, it's not a totally stupid idea. You know, it might be, but you know, you wake up in the morning and you find your, your car's battery's only half full and you plugged it in 12 hours before because it's been needed to keep other people's lights on. This is not the modern world we mm -hmm. need if we're to, mm -hmm. you know, run businesses and do things and rely upon things. Um, uh, there's, there's, we always talked about a trilemma in energy to solving three different problems at once, low carbon, reliability, and affordability. And we've completely forgotten about the second two. At the moment, it's a one-legged stool. And I don't know about you, but I find one-legged stools rather hard to just sit on. Absolutely. Now, Matt, I wonder if to end, what would what would be your message then to the Prime Minister and his government on this? And, and I... I really do worry as a supporter, as I know you are as well, of course, that this issue could end up becoming pretty toxic for the party in the future. It might not be in the next five years. It might not be in the next 10. But I think they're making life quite easy for the likes of, I don't know, Lawrence Fox maybe and Nigel Farage who are waiting in the wings looking for that single issue to champion and wax lyrical about in the same way that UKIP did on, on Brexit for many, many years very, very successfully. So I wonder what your message would be to the Prime Minister as a supportive friend. Well, I think I would say, please, please get realistic. Um, uh, move away from this sing single obsession. Uh, let's get balance back into the discussion. Uh, we're not getting international brownie points from being ahead of the pack on this kind of stuff. China's still building vast numbers of coal-fired power stations. Uh, they're going to go on um, increasing their use of fossil fuels till at least 2030. Um, so we're not setting an example that the world is following. Uh, we can, we should, in my view, be doing a lot of nature-based solutions, you know, planting trees here and there and looking after our habitats and doing something about invasive species like gray squirrels that are wiping out red squirrels. You know, th that's the real threat to species biodiversity, by the way. Um, uh, you know, let's do, uh, let's, you know, plastic, overfishing in the oceans. These, th this is where you can get your green credentials by doing real things that need really to, to be done, not obsessing about the energy system. Um, use gas, which is plentiful, cheap and reliable for your mainstay of our energy system. Drive down the cost of nuclear with a ton of research and development into fusion, because it might well be the answer in relatively short space of time. And then in 10 or 15 years time, transform the energy system then. But at the moment, you are falling for a crony capitalist industry that is bending your ear, not for real environmentalism of the kind that I support. Matt Ridley, thank you very much for joining Reason today. Thank you, Darren. Lovely to talk to you. Now, as I say, please do consider hitting that little subscribe button and the notification bell. We're over halfway to our fundraising target, which you can find in the description. I'll also post a link to Matt's latest book as well, which you should all check out. Cheers. See you next time.